it a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk him up. Chris Taylor. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Daniel Starkin, Blake Williams. The offseason basically began this morning, boys, and the Dodgers are already making moves, except maybe not the move people are all that excited about, bringing back a guy who I would say is a polarizing figure on an extension. Max Muncy, who had a club option for this upcoming season, rather than picking up that club option, the Dodgers have negotiated a new contract, a two-year contract worth $24 million with an additional $10 million club option tacked on the backside of this. Um, none of us, I don't think we're surprised, will be surprised that Max Muncy is coming back next year. Daniel, give me your reaction to the Dodgers pushing that club option back two years and getting a two-year $24 million deal done with Muncy. Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to Blake. I see the new studio there. It's it's looking nice, looking looking official now. Um, but but yeah, I, I like this deal a lot. I think I think it's a really team friendly deal here. I mean, Max Muncy, uh, you could basically pencil in you know 30, 35 homers, hundred RBIs. Um, we know the defense isn't great. We know the batting average is not going to be super high, but he's still a really productive player that contributes to winning. And I think it it's 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 kind of clear that he he wanted to stick around because if like, let's say Max Muncy was on the open market right now as a free agent, he would get much more than two years and 24 million. So um, to me, this is a good start to the off season. I know uh, like, like you said, Muncy's kind of a polarizing figure, but he's still a productive player and, and 12 million a year. I mean, that feels like a steal. Like I think I'm pretty sure that's what the Dodgers gave Noah Syndergaard last year. Like, so um to, to be able to get to lock Muncy in for three years, like we don't really know where he's going to be playing, but we know he's going to be in the middle of that lineup somewhere and he's going to be hitting bombs. So I like it a lot. Blake, we'll get to the defensive piece that Daniel alludes to there. Offensively, you look at his numbers. For one, he's a pretty durable guy. Um, you know, you look back basically since 2018, he's played two, 137, 141, 58 out of 60, 144, 136, 135. That's pretty good durability for a guy like Muncie and of those full seasons, four of the five full seasons, he has had 35 or more home runs, two 35 home run seasons, two 36 home run seasons. The weighted runs created plus last season is 118. So he's about 20% better than league average as an offensive player. All that considered, I'm with Daniel two years, 24 million sounds remarkably low for a guy like Max Muncie. Yeah, it's a great contract for the Dodgers. It's good to get Muncie back. I think we all kind of figured they'd pick up his option this year for $14 million, so to get him back at a $12 million AAV saves them a little money, gets them an extra year, and it provides some insurance at multiple positions, which we're going to get into more. But Max Muncy is a great hitter. He's had some downtime because of his elbow injury and everything, but last year he started to get back to form, and that's something Dave Roberts talked about. He said, we feel Muncy's fully back to where he was before the injury, so it kind of shows their confidence in him. And if there's one thing we've seen that it's hitting homers wins you postseason games. And we know Max Muncy is good at hitting homers. So to have him back in the lineup, it's really good for the team. Yeah. I mean, JD Martinez got a one year, $10 million deal last year as a guy who was exclusively a designated hitter. Again, we will get into what position Max Muncy will be playing for the next two years for the Dodgers, at least what we think, but it's worth pointing out to get a guy for basically $12 million a year who also provides you defense and Defense at a couple different positions, even if it's not incredible. He's also younger. Muncy just turned 33. I think that's, again, we're all agreeing it's great value. Looking at his Savant page, by the way, Muncy last year, 88th percentile in expected weighted on base average, 90th percentile in expected slugging, 79th percentile exit velocity, 90th percentile barrel rate, 80th percentile hard hit rate, 81st percentile chase rate, 96th percentile walk rate. The only numbers that are in blue were the expected batting average, the whiff rate, and the strikeout rate. But when eight of the 10 categories are dark red on StatCast and the other two or three are in the blue, you know what you're getting for Max Muncy. They're not paying him $30 million a year. So the makeup of the player, I think, makes an, a lot of sense. And by the way, that $10 million, which had turned into a $14 million team option because of incentives, um, gets tacked on to the end. So the Dodgers have a two-year deal with the option to make this a very affordable three-year deal should they get there. All of that said, let's now address the elephant in the room. And Blake, I'll start with you. 
where the heck is Max Muncy playing defensively? It was a big storyline at the end of last year, how bad he had become at third base. We know he has said prior, he prefers to play second base. Um, there is a Miguel Vargas size hole at second base heading into the 2024 season. He can play first base. He will not be playing first base. He can be a designated hitter. There happens to be a prominent free agent by the name of Shohei Otani who plays the designated hitter position <laughs> offensively. So what do you make of this, Blake? Is he going to play third base again next year and then kind of figure it out after that? I think as of right now, that's the plan. But like you said, he could fill in at second base for them if needed. We don't know what they're entirely doing there. If they ended up wanting to upgrade the defense at third base, like moving Max Muncy over is a good way to do that. It's, you don't want to say this, but Freeman isn't like oh. not going to get hurt. It's not a guarantee that he's going to stay healthy. So there as, is some, as close to a guarantee as it gets, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, but you can't fully guarantee it. So there is of some course. insurance there with yeah. Max Muncy being in the fold. Like if Freddie Freeman did get hurt, like you have Max Muncy who can go there and you're losing a lot there, but it's still probably one of the better backups at any position in baseball. And like you said, he, there's Otani that they're going to go after for a designated hitter. But if they end up missing out on him for whatever reason, then Max Muncy can slide right in there perfectly. He basically replaces J.D. Martinez and you don't have to worry about having to find a DH. So there's a few different ways they could go with Muncy. It's probably just going to end up being at third base, but they have options. Daniel, to me, my immediate reaction to this move was it feels like it is an indictment of Miguel Vargas. You and I talked briefly. Michael Bush probably belongs in that conversation as well. Um, do, you, do you see it that way? Like, is 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 can you read into this move what the Dodgers think about Miguel Vargas and Michael Bush, do you think? I, I'm gonna be honest here. I, I think it's too early to say. Like, I think we got to see what other moves are made. Like, obviously, they're still. We we hope they're still gonna chase Otani here. And and if that's the case, then Muncy's not gonna be playing DH very often, which means he's gonna be in the field probably at third. Um. So so like if that's the case, then then yeah, probably they don't have a ton of confidence that that Bush and, and Vargas could handle those spots. Um, but let's say they don't get Otani and they don't bring back J.D. Martinez. Then you're looking at Max Muncy as a full-time DH and and you got third and second base are, are still open. So I, I think we got to see what other moves, you know, they make. I think I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, going into the season, expecting Miguel Vargas to be an everyday player or Michael Bush to be an everyday player um, is probably asking a bit too much after we saw the season. But at the same time, those guys have done it at every minor league level and, and, you know, they deserve at least some sort of opportunity to yeah. see if, you know, how good they could be at the major league level. Um, I know they kind of gave Vargas, you know, that runway last year and he didn't exactly run with it. But he's, he's still a young player. He still has that prospect pedigree. So I, I definitely think we'll have to see what moves are made. Like, do they do they trade, you know, either Bush or Vargas? Um, so so I, I think there's a lot of moves to be made. And I think. Uh, with Muncy, with his ability to, I know, like we said, it's not good defense, but he could play multiple positions in theory. Um, you know, that just gives you more flexibility going into the offseason. So I think that's the main thing here. Like, if if you wind up finding another good third baseman, then you could move Muncy uh, to DH, or or he could play second every once in a while. I wouldn't want him as my everyday second baseman necessarily, but um, if he had to play there a couple times a week, I think it would be all right. But um, yeah, I definitely think, you know, just getting this out of the way, locking him up at a, at a team friendly cost, um, allows you to go kind of in a variety of different directions. So that's what I like about it. Blake, do, what about you? Do you read into this as a reflection on Miguel Vargas or Michael Bush? Not entirely. I think it's just, they see it as getting good value on a quality player. They could always end up trading any of those guys, including Muncie. It was reported last year. They talked about including Muncie in an Arenado deal. So it just gives them more options to kind of set their team how they want. We already mentioned if Muncy was a free agent, he would be getting more on the open market. So when you can keep a player in the fold for below their market value, it's always a good thing because it just gives you more options. Um, the the obvious follow-up to this is, does this say anything or impact their pursuit of Shohei Otani? Blake, I'll come to you first. Muncy is a guy that we just described his defensive uh, abilities or lack thereof. He's not quite... JD Martinez in left field levels of bad defensively. I still think he has the capacity to be competent. And again, he would probably tell you that if they moved him to second base, it would be better than what we saw from him at third base. I I'm not sure any of us agree with him, but at least he, he might think that. Um, 
but do you see any any way in which a guy who doesn't have a defensive position might be best suited to be a designated hitter? What, does this reflect the Dodgers' pursuit of Otani, do you think? I'm going to say no, because I think they've been kind of planning for Otani. Like, if you kind of look at their moves, that's the only thing that's made sense in the past few seasons of them, like, going after Otani and wanting to get him. But at the same time, like, Muncie is better suited for DH, so maybe. I think you could look at it either way. Like, Muncie's better suited for DH, so now they have that guy and they don't need Otani. Or you can look at it as saying they're going to have to pay Otani 50 or 60 million a year. And now you have a quality player locked up below market value. So that could help their pursuit of Otani. So there's kind of two ways of looking at it. I still think it's going to be more no, they're going to go after Otani regardless. And if they don't want both of them, if they want Muncie at DH, then they could end up trading Muncie in another deal. So yeah, I, I think it's still going to be Otani's their number one target. Daniel, you agree? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think they and and I agree. It, like, if this is how they're looking, I think they look at it as kind of a trade off. Where like, yeah, you might not be getting great defense at third base from Max Muncy, but at the same time, you would have a top five in your lineup of Mookie, Freddie, Otani, Muncy, and Will Smith, and, and that team is going to score a ton of runs. So I think you you live with the defense when when your lineup is that stacked. Um, so until I see, uh, until, I mean, it's not like there's another third baseman on the roster right now yeah. that's, you know, an everyday type guy. So until until I see them, you know, make another move at third base and essentially lock Max Muncy into, D, into the DH spot, um, I'm still going to believe that they're in on Otani just because that's that's a game changing type of player. And, and if you have to have Max Muncy at third base for a couple years so you can have Otani for the next decade, you do that every day. I mean, yeah. come on. I think what what Blake said is is really good in that like if you're gonna pay sixty million, fifty million a year for Otani, then you've got to find ways to get creative financially. Adding a player of Max Muncy's caliber, as flawed as he might be, for twelve million dollars a year and a third team option year of of ten million, I think gives you some some of that flexibility. And I also think it's worth pointing out that every player and every situation needs to be looked at holistically. For twelve million dollars, if you're getting a third baseman who StatCast had as the fourth percentile for range outs above average last year. Um, and yet you're getting a player from a offensive perspective, who's 20% better than league average. Who's, you know, like on the whole batting run value, let's say is 74th percentile. That probably evens out to a guy who's worth, you know, in the 15 to $16 million a year range. And you just signed him for 12 add in the fact there isn't an obvious replacement internally. You know, you could talk about Bush and Vargas. Neither of those guys are obvious defensive improvements at third base. They're definitely not offensive improvements. And so it's not like there was a backup plan internally that made a ton of sense. There's not a guy on the free agent market who on the whole offense plus defense, you could get as an improvement for less than $12 million a year. You could, of course, go trade for a Nolan Arenado or something like that. But again, if you want to be swimming in the big dollar number guys like Otani and Yamamoto, then you've got to have some $12 million a year players to fill out your roster if you want this team to be competitive. And so I think that's how I interpret this. I, I don't think it's a reflection of Vargas and Bush because neither of those guys were fighting for third base innings necessarily. And I don't think it's a reflection of Otani because I think they probably just looked at the market, looked at the internal options and said, if we can get Muncie for 12 million bucks, he's definitely our best option at third base. So that's how I land before we move on to some questions, Michael, I see we've got a super chat from you. That's shifting us topic wise a little bit. Um, Daniel or Blake, anything last you would want to add on this Muncie thing before we take some live questions about maybe where we go from here. I will say, go ahead. Go ahead. Go? Okay. Go ahead. After the Dodgers were eliminated in Arizona, we were in the clubhouse and I heard Max Muncie talking to James Outman saying he does hope he was going to be back with the Dodgers in 2024. He didn't entirely know what his future held because of the option years, but it's pretty clear he wanted to come back. So I think it's always good when you have a guy in the fold who wants to be here. The team clearly wants him here. So I think that's beneficial overall for everyone. Daniel? Yeah, I was I was just going to say, like, I think we all know, like, Max Muncy has his warts. He's not a perfect player by any means, but he, he was still a three-war player last year, and that, like, wasn't even close to his best year. Like, there's still value in – you know, what he brings to the table. Like he's not going to hit for a high average, but he's going to work counts. He's going to take walks. Like Blake said, he's going to hit the big homer for you that you need 
in October. Like we saw, uh, we, anyone who just watched the playoffs knows the Rangers hit a ton of home runs. All the teams that went far, the Phillies, the Astros, they all hit a lot of home runs, and, and that's what Max Muncy does. He's he's done it in the postseason in the past. Um, so I just think at twelve million, like it, 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 it's really a no brainer to me. Like you'll figure out the defense, you'll figure out the rest later. Like to have a three war player. Um, you know, that that hits 35 homers a year for 12 million. Um, you know, that's that's a great deal if you ask me. Yeah. And, and, you know, you could look at some of the splits and say, hey, the batting average is 30 points better in the second half. And again, we're not saying he's going to be a guy that's going to hit 300, but there's a big difference between hitting 230 versus 198. You know, so I think if you look and say, hey, this is a guy who is coming off of an elbow injury that he suffered at the end of last season, is it possible that maybe some of the timing in his swing, didn't quite get it. So, you know, who knows? You could talk yourself into this in a bunch of different ways. But to your point, Daniel, this is a four and a half win player in 18, almost a five win player in 19, almost a five win player in 2021 before the last two seasons have dipped. And so if, if the reality of Muncie is somewhere between the 2.9 and the 4.8, then you're getting great value here. Um, okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, Michael says this, the Dodgers should sign Tyler Maley to a three-year deal. He's a great veteran. Uh, Blake, you have any, any, uh, you got a Tyler Maley perspective there? Yeah, I think when we were kind of planning out the offseason, how their roster could look, I think I threw him in on one of my Dodgers signings just as a buy low kind of guy. He was really good with the Reds, and then he got traded for a lot. I think it was two years ago, if I remember right, or a year ago, but yeah, he was a really good pitcher. Yeah, and then he got hurt. So I think he's a guy the Dodgers would like to buy low on and see if they can get them in the mix for like one year plus an option kind of thing. They've done it with guys in the past and he would probably like to go to the Dodgers. They've been kind of a pitching factory and getting their guys with their careers back on track. So like, I'm all for it. I don't think he'll get a three-year deal, but one with an option seems fair. Just turned 29. I mean, the number I like to look at is what's your expected ERA 2020, 3.37, 21, 21, 3.7, 22, 3.5. This past season, he threw just 25 innings, um, but was effective in those five starts, I guess you could say. So those are the types of players that like, you know, hey, we know the Dodgers are going to need pitching and they might need a bunch of pitching. So, Daniel, in your as you've start, you know, none of us, I don't think, have fully formulated our offseason plan for the Dodgers. But is the Tyler Maley sort of the project type back end of the rotation? Like, do you have? a spot for that in your offseason plan or should the Dodgers be looking at high upside guys and trusting the Michael Groves, Gavin stones, uh, you know, Kyle hurts of the world to kind of be the Tyler Maley replacements. I mean, I, I think we're all in agreement that the Dodgers are going to need at least one top of the line starter. Um, and, and I don't think any of us are saying Maley is that guy. So he would kind of fall more into the category of like the, you know, a depth guy and innings yeah. eater. Um, but it but it, it does scream Dodgers just because he's coming off an injury. So you're you you'll be getting him at a discount. Like Blake said, you could do like the the two year deal with the option or whatever that we've seen them do so many times. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes you never hear the name again. Um. So so I could definitely see the Dodgers doing that. There's some upside there. I, he he had good stuff when he was healthy. Um. But if he like he's not a guy you're bringing in to rely on as like a top three starter. Like he's he's more of a, of like hope he could get healthy in the second half of the year and and contribute. Um, so as long as long as you know it's in addition to to other moves in the rotation, I'd be fine with it. Um, if you've got any questions that you want to uh, to throw in the chat, feel free to do that now. Just put all caps questions, and we'll get to a few of these while we've got the time. We appreciate everybody here joining us on a Thursday afternoon, chiming in. And, and the stove is that. hot. Thank you. Exactly. Real, exactly. Real no. quick though, on uh, October sixteenth, I threw in Molly on my projections for the Dodgers roster next year, and I said he's absolutely the type of buy low upside guy they target. And Daniel said I just threw his name in there like we wouldn't notice. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, it, this also feels like the type of guy, Blake, that if they do sign him eight months from now, you'll be complaining that Maley's the type of guy that they signed. Also, is that fair? If they don't sign anyone else with it, I think that's fair. But if you're signing Yamamoto and him, then like, yeah, sure. That's great. I'm happy with that. I think Blake is the only one that came up with a detailed offseason plan that include included a, a Tyler Molly in it on October 16th. <laughs> yeah. That was more I, what it was you know, about. Not that I hate, hate Molly or anything. 
<laughs> we recorded a video on uh, on Tommy Pham that I don't know if it made it up. And now that the World Series is over, who knows if that, that video will make it up. But I remember joking because I looked through my notes and two years ago. So November of 2021, I was like, the Dodgers should sign Tommy Pham. He was part of my offseason plan. It's like two years, 12 million bucks or something. So I was just way ahead of the curve on that one with Tommy Pham. <laughs> but uh, but there you go. Um, I think me and Blake are team jocks, so I think we we would have been against bringing in fam. Yeah, Man, um, Michael wants won't. to know, Blake, where's the bucket hat? Um, it is right here. I just decided yeah. to wear the World Series one for Muncie today. There you go. There you go. In honor of Max Muncie, uh, Hawaiian Kira wants to know what's our what's the status on Gavin Lux? We Blake, as far as I know, we don't have a status update on Gavin Lux. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't think there's anything major that's come out yet. He should be ready for opening day, and we'll see him in spring training, I'm sure. Yeah, and stay tuned to this channel. We might have some news on that front uh, in the next couple of weeks or so. So stay tuned. Um, Doom says, question, I am more confident Otani is going to Seattle or San Francisco thoughts. I definitely think Seattle's the team that, I mean, I guess he's in, that team is included, but that just feels... Um, it's a West coast team, obviously the ties to Ichiro. It's a team that is young and exciting and seems to be on the upswing, yada, yada, yada. So these, those two definitely feel like the biggest contenders for Otani. Um, Daniel, I mean, like he's kind of saying, do you have any degree of confidence that the Dodgers are going to land Otani over a Seattle or a San Francisco? Look, I don't think anyone really knows what Otani wants, at least at this point. Like, there hasn't really been a whole, you know, a ton of rumors as far as, you know, what he's interested in. I I know the, the West Coast is something that's been said for years, but who really knows? Um, yeah. The only thing that's giving me confidence is that what we, you know, what we saw from the last year for the Dodgers, like, you know, they kind of sat out free agency last year, didn't make a ton of moves at the deadline. Like, the whole time, it's just kind of felt like they're gearing up to give Otani this monster deal. I don't know how much the injury plays a plays a role in that. Like, I don't know how hesitant that will get them. Um, you're definitely not going to get him on a discount. So that's kind of what makes me not as confident because we know the Dodgers aren't necessarily the ones to go out and throw out the biggest offer that often. But to me, if there's anyone that is worth it, it's Otani. And that's, I, I know the Dodgers have been, you know, interested in Otani pretty much since he was in high school. So um, I guess that's kind of what gives me confidence. But at the end of the day, we still don't know what he wants. We still don't know what what teams are going to go out and throw some crazy offer that, you know, yeah. you might not not be able to match. So uh, we'll see. I have no clue, um, but I'm hoping for the best. Like, I still think that's, you know, should be the first priority. No doubt. Blake, where are you? I mean, like when Daniel says they they haven't shelled out, it is true. The Dodgers have tended to be outbid. I will say the fact that they, you know, reportedly offered Corey Seager eight years, $250 million the year before he hit free agency. The fact that they paid Mookie enough money to prevent him from hitting free agency. They obviously, you know, the Freddie Freeman thing, I know we've gone back and forth on. They, they, people thought that contract was too big. I mean, they have ponied up at times in unique situations. There have been other times where they've decided to try to go for a shorter deal or something. So um, where do you land on Otani confidence today as free agency officially begins? I think the Dodgers are really selective with the players they target and who they're willing to give big contracts to. Like, they're not going to be the Angels and go and throw big money to every single player that they want who goes on the market. Although they did offer Rendon, to be fair. <laughs> they did. But they still got outbid there. So Thankfully. we can thank the Angels for that. And Rendon didn't want to be here. But yeah, I think the Dodgers, they're aggressive on short-term deals with players who they like but aren't in love with long-term, like we saw it with Bryce Harper. So I feel like Otani is going to be one of those selective guys where they're going to be like, we need to get this guy in our organization. He fits everything we want, not just on the field, but he brings the marketing value and just yeah. all of that extra stuff with him. So I still feel like the Dodgers are the favorites here. We don't entirely know what Otani wants, but it's been pretty well known. He does want to win. That's the only thing Otani has said out loud about it. So might rule out the Giants there. The Mariners are up there where you could say they win enough to entice Otani to come play for them. But I still think the Dodgers are the front runner there if, if they decide they want to pay him whatever he wants. We'll get to a couple more questions here. Saki Bomb, I think, asks a good question here. We're talking about all this money being spent. Does bringing Muncie back lead to a potential moving on from Chris Taylor, another guy who's got a big contract number there? Um, Daniel, do you see... A correlation there that the that Taylor could be a guy who 
ultimately ends up on the move as a result of choosing to lock Muncie down? Uh, I think maybe if they like re-sign Kike or something, like I still think at the end of the day, you, you need that utility guy. And I know Chris Taylor, like he's probably making more, like a little more than he should, but at the same time, he still can play anywhere, you know, all over the field. He's still like a solid hitter. Like I think um, he had a pretty underrated season, I'd say. Like he wasn't great by any means, but I think a lot of people like were under the impression that he was trashed this whole season. And I thought he was pretty solid. Um, I know we talked about how he should have been in the lineup in the playoffs. Um, so I definitely think that's a guy like who has value. And I don't think on the trade market, like realistically, you're probably not going to get much for him unless you're eating, you know, up a portion of the contract. And at that point, is it even worth it? Probably not. So I, I think Taylor is a guy who's probably going to stick around. Um, I think I think what he signed a four year deal. So he's got two yeah. years left. So maybe maybe if you get through this year. Um, and then it's, it's, you know, an expiring contract, then maybe, you know, there's more value in moving him, him then. But I, I think, um, having, having a guy like Chris Taylor, who you could plug and play anywhere, um, is definitely still valuable. Blake, what are your thoughts? I'm looking at his numbers. He was a one Oh four weighted runs created plus this year. Taylor was, and then sort of going back a few years, 2019, he was a two or two win player, 2020, one and a half war, obviously shortened season three war in 2021 two in 2022, two in 2023. Of course, he's not playing every day. The last two years, um, 118 and 117 games. He'll be 33 next season, as Daniel alluded to, uh, $15 million a year for the next two years, plus a club option for Taylor. I mean, if the Dodgers go out and get Notani, if they go out and get a Yamamoto, Taylor is kind of the only guy who is signed to a contract that is probably in – I hate to say it this way, like an, an ancillary piece, an unnecessary piece. You could kind of move him off the roster and it probably doesn't dramatically move the needle on the qual overall quality of the team. So could you see that becoming a crunch that the Dodgers end up having to make a decision on? It could happen, but I don't think it'll happen mainly for the reason that if they trade him, they're probably going to have to eat some of that money and say, if you're eating 5 million of his deal to have him on another team, I feel like at that point you'd rather just keep him for 15 rather than saving the 10 million because yeah. they would end up needing to replace him anyways with a guy who's probably going to be paid like five or six million. Like we saw Peralta get that much this year to be a platoon player. Yeah. And with Chris Taylor, he'd probably end up being a platoon guy in left field essentially, but also he provides the versatility to play every other position where you need him. So I just think financially it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless a team is willing to eat all his money. And I'm not sure that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting one. It's hard to tell. Taylor's like the perfect example of, I have no idea what his market value is. Um, $15 million a year feels like a lot, but how much do other teams value the defensive versatility? Um, and that type of thing is, is an interesting one. Uh, all right, let's get to one more question. I'm scrolling through these here. Um, some, uh, some Halloween questions, but we'll, we'll avoid that. Um, let's see. There was one in here. Um, here we go. Put a package together for another pitcher on the block. Corbin Burns, uh, assuming we sign, uh, I love this, assuming we sign Otani <laughs> and Yamamoto, but they put together a trade for another big starter who is involved in that trade. So kind of like, I'll put this off so we can see Blake's beautiful face here. Um, but we talked about a couple guys who could be on the move if the Dodgers end up going out to try and get themselves a starting pitcher. O on one hand, if the Dodgers go out and give uh, Yamamoto, 25 million a year and Otani, you know, if those two guys end up making $80 million a year for the next six or seven years, you're going to need some rookie level players to fill out a roster just to keep things reasonable on the payroll perspective. So if they sign both of those guys, it almost feels like they probably don't trade rookies for a high priced, you know, guy who's either in the last year or two of arbitration or who they would need to resign, i.e. Corbin Burns pretty quickly. Um, that would be my initial thought. On the flip side, you just re-signed Muncie. Michael Bush feels like if he's not going to, he feels like a guy who could easily be on a trade block. Um, I, I guess Miguel Vargas as well. If you're adding a starting pitcher, maybe it is a Gavin Stone. Daniel, are there other guys that you can think of other than Michael Bush and Vargas Stone, those types of players? Michael Grove, I guess, maybe, like as guys that would be potential trade pieces? I just think you look at um, the areas of the farm system where you do have depth. And so I think, you know, young starting pitching, the Dodgers have a ton of that. So you, you yeah. named a couple names there. 
Um, Emmett Sheehan is, you know, if, if it's a big enough deal and you'd be willing to part with him. Um, I, I definitely think Bush is a, you know, a prime trade candidate just because we saw, we pretty much saw how the organization felt about him this past season when they, yeah. you know, didn't really give him many opportunities. And, you, you know, you either got to play him or deal him at this point because <laughs> the value isn't going to be where it's at right now for much longer. Like he's, he's absolutely mashed at every minor league level. He's coming off a great season at AAA. So if you're going to deal him, now is the time. Um, and then I also think, you know, catching is still a, a position of, you know, depth in the farm system. Who knows um, long term is is Will Smith. Are they going to pay what it takes to keep him? Um, and if they are, then that means you have Diego Cartaya, Dalton rushing and a couple even a couple more catching prospects down there. So I definitely think there's depth in the farm system that if you want to go up, you know, go out and, and make a big deal. Uh, you can, and and I think we'll we'll see about Yamamoto and Otani and whatnot. But I definitely think um, they're going to need to address starting pitching. That's that's clear. Yeah. Um, you know, there's going to be you know we know the free agent market is what it is. Like you could go and pay an Aaron Nola, you could go and pay a Blake Snell or or you know Sonny Gray or you know Marcus Stroman or whatever. But um, you know, I don't think either none of those guys are necessarily like top tier for me. So if if you could get a Corbin Burns on the trade market or you know, if some other guys become available, I know they were interested in Dylan Cease last year. Um, I definitely think that's that's something that could definitely be a possibility. Before before you answer, Blake, I want to apologize to Matt Moreno because Daniel didn't mention Austin Barnes anywhere in the organizational catching depth, which is you know, <laughs> I, just, I know Matt is going to be mad about that. So I want to apologize to him. I know he's the real him. apology should be going to Hunter Fiducia, who who's yeah. coming off a pretty good year. <laughs> uh, no disagreements here, uh, Blake. I mean, anybody that that you I think Daniel makes a good point. At some point, they might tap into that catching depth to make a move. I've talked a lot about that there is a 40-man roster crunch. It feels like coming at some point, they're going to have all these guys coming off the 60-day IL who they have to put back on the 40-man. Of course, they have a bunch of free agents, so spots are now open. But then you've got a couple guys that need to be protected, guys that got called up at the end of the season. At some point, it feels like they need to deal a few of these guys in order to get some value back. Do you think this offseason is when they cash in some chips? Yeah, it probably feels like they need to do that this offseason. They have guys who are expendable. I know they've had some conversations regarding Michael Bush and a trade there and the Brewers are a team that likes him. So maybe there's a match to be made there with some of their pitchers. Corbin Burns is obviously the big one, but Freddie Peralta is also an interesting name. So we'll see where they go there. I think Diego Cartaya is a piece they could trade pretty easily, but he's also coming off a down year. So yeah. they might want to see if they can rebuild his value a bit. And they do have a lot of young pitchers who other teams would be very interested in but the Dodgers also kind of need those pitchers so yeah maybe you could move Gavin Stone or Emmett Sheehan or Ryan Pepio but you'd probably have to keep two of them still so yeah. I think they have a lot of options this offseason on what they could do and they probably do need to move some of those pieces out yeah and Landon Knack is another guy who uh, I've always kind of liked from afar just the the metrics and the numbers that you see on him but clearly you know he's eighth or ninth on that list of of starting pitching prospects that are fighting for back end of the rotation spots. And so he's probably a guy that could go be a number five starter somewhere in the league next year, but clearly the Dodgers maybe don't feel like he's at the level that they need him to be, or, or they just have guys ahead of him. So there you go. Well, Hey folks, we appreciate you joining us here on a Thursday afternoon. I know we could sit here and answer questions. We are going to have a live show Sunday night. And the topic of that is going to be talking about the biggest questions the Dodgers face this off season. So 7, 10 PM on Sunday night, every Sunday night, make sure you're here on the Dodger blue channel. You can subscribe and ring the notification bell. If you're a podcast person, thank you to listening to this. You can find us the Dodger heads podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, anywhere you get your podcasts as well. That is Daniel Starkin. That is Blake Williams. My name is Jeff Spiegel. Thank you folks. As always enjoy the rest of your day. And as always go Dodgers.